Good evening, everybody. My name is Hanko Jurgens, working at the Duitsland Institute Amsterdam, and I'm the moderator of this evening. First of all, I want to commemorate the victims of the Ukraine war. We feel very sad to discuss a delicate and painful history of the Second World War. Well, there is a still, still a horrible war in Ukraine. This evening is organized by the Koninklijk Nederlands Historisch Genootschap, the Amsterdam School of Historical Studies, the Manasse Ben Israel Institute, and the Duitsland Institute at the University of Amsterdam. Various important issues are at stake. The life of notary Arnold van der Berg during the Second World War, the arrest of eight Jews at the Prinsengracht 263, the role of the Jewish Council during the World War, Second World War, and the huge impression of the false suspicion made on the Jewish community in Europe. And not in the last place, on Miriam de Gorter, granddaughter of Arnold van der Berg, who will speak today. A warm welcome to you, Miriam, and to the family van den Berg, who is also, one could say, reunited, more or less, thanks to this, well, the book, let's say it this way. Um, this evening I will first shortly introduce the discussion, after which Bart Wallet will present the report, The Be Betrayal of Anne Frank, a refutation, critical analysis of the argumentation and use of historical sources. Then there is time for discussion, and we will end the evening with a short address of Miriam de Gorter, a granddaughter and of Ruben Viss, General Secretary of the Dutch Israeli Religious Community, NEIK, who will discuss the impact uh, of the book made on the Jewish community in the Netherlands as well as in Europe. On the 4th of August 1944, between 10.30 and 11 a.m., a small group of police officers uh, under command of SS Hauptschafuhr Karl Silberbauer entered Prinsengracht 263 in Amsterdam. They inspected the storeroom in the main building and discovered the revolving uh, door to the secret annex where Anne Frank uh, was hiding. Her family, the family van Pels, and the dentist Fritz Pfeffer were arrested. Two hours later, it must have felt much longer than that, they were transported to the SD building at the Euterpe Straat and only Otto Frank survived the war. After the war, two police, in police investigations took place to find out what happened on this day. And despite much effort, they couldn't find a suspect of the betray betrayal of Anne Frank. Only recently, a so-called cold case team asserted to be 85 to 87 percent uh, sure to have found a suspect. Uh, this cold case team presents their study as a law enforcement investigation uh, with the Anne Frank House as the crime scene. In Dutch you say plaats delict. Historians as judges of history. At first sight, this seems to be an exciting exercise since both historians as well as judges are in search of the truth but at second glance this is a very tricky affair since they depend on different epistemologies for a criminal investigation the interrogation of a suspect is a key element of the prosecution process the historian however depends on the availability of sources and if there are not enough sources to find a suspect uh, one could only hope to find enough information to contextualize the crime the famous historian Carlo Ginzburg, who studied the 16th century prosecution of the heretic Miller uh, Menoxio, stated that the historian has a special responsibility towards the dead, since the dead cannot speak back. We have to be very careful. Therefore, making a crime scene investigation of the arrest of eight Jews at the Prinsengracht studied by a cold case team is worrisome particularly when the investigation itself could be used as a film script. One of the problematic aspects of the book is the use and interpretation of sources. 
Valuing and contextualizing the sources is part of the craftsmanship of historians. Professional historians working at universities benefit a lot of uh, those studies made by uh, not trained historians who do often high regarded research, particularly about, uh, when it's uh, on regional studies of the Second World War. But in the case of the betrayal of Anne Frank, it doesn't work well. Or as a German historian and expert on the subject, Gerhard Hirschfeld said in the Welt, uh, the book cannot be saved anymore. The self-appointed cold case team broke various standards of historical research. Firstly, historians should treat their sources with care, and when the sources do not give reliable answers to the research questions, you better not jump to conclusions. Secondly, it's of big importance to verify research results by discussing it with other historians, preferably with known specialists in the field. Thirdly, authorship is an important indicator of the quality of the work. In the case of the cold case team, it has not been clear who is responsible for the research claims. Is it the Canadian author of the book? Is it the American FBI agent? Or is it the Dutch head of research? The Dutch production company Produzione invited a Canadian author and an American FBI agent to tell their story. In the 60 minutes documentary, is it a 60 minutes documentary or documentary series? Uh, Vince Pancoke there in this documentary is the main uh, investigator. So seen from this perspective, we should judge the betrayal not only on its historical minutes, uh, merits, but also on the legal conditions, uh, on the conditions of criminal investigation. Contemporary cold case teams are often surprisingly successful by using new research methods such as DNA profiling, CCTV camera images or artificial intelligence. But in this case, the conclusions rely particularly on traditional sources which are valued and interpreted while working towards conclusions. If the betrayal really was a law enforcement investigation, the team should have acted according to investigative criteria they know very well. Firstly, speaking about a collective body of circumstantial evidence and how it fits together appears to be not enough to accuse somebody of a crime. Secondly, if it's indeed a criminal case, the accused should have access to a lawyer to defend himself. And thirdly, the team should have respected the so-called presumption of innocence, which is the legal principle that every person accused of any crime is considered innocent until proven guilty. When a team of former police officers, uh, journalists, criminologists, data specialists, statisticians, historians is convinced that there is an 85% chance to have found a suspect, actually there is no suspect. It is either 100% or none. To conclude, the cold case team should withdraw their conclusions and stop continuing to defend their claims and certainly not work further on future products, be it revised books, documentaries, or films, film on this, films on this subject. Personally, I sympathize more with the old Wittgenstein, but the young Wittgenstein had a very good advice. It is the seventh uh, proposition of the Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus, whereof one cannot speak one should be silent. And we are, of course, we are not against uh, the freedom of speech, but if one wants to make a historical or juridical claim, one should be very sure. And if that's not the case, you better leave the subject matter to others. The floor is to Bart Wallet. Ladies and gentlemen, it's impressive to see so many people here today. The book, The Betrayal of Anne Frank, stirred up a lot of things, has opened old wounds and raised many questions. Questions about the Second World War, the persecution of Jews, collaboration and betrayal, and the position of the Jewish community in this very dark period of history. Soon after the publishing of this book, we, as historians from 
various universities and research institutions read it and started comparing his arguments to the documents we had earlier encountered in our research. We contacted each other, sharing our findings, and decided to write a report together. Why did we do so? First, we felt we had to step in because we owed it to our discipline. The book caused a huge public debate over the past, and we noticed that a lot of the historical context got lost, and wrong assumptions were raised, resulting in a distortion, rather than gaining a better understanding of the past. Second, because the book deals with the most iconic story of the Shoah, the Holocaust, the history of Anne Frank and the secret annex. This book, therefore, did more than just designate a betrayer in an unresolved historic case. Here, the person immediately becomes the iconic betrayer in the iconic Holocaust story. For such a claim to be made, the historical reconstruction and argumentation better had to be solid as a rock, which, as we soon established, was not the case. Not at all. So, who are we? Let me shortly introduce the historians who have compiled this report together. Each one of us has written on her or his own field of specialization, using sources that we already knew from previous research, while also checking as much relevant additional historical documents as possible in the short period of time we had. Now, um, we have two specialists in the history of the Jewish Council in the Netherlands. Dr. Laurien Vastenhout of the NIOT Institute for War, Holocaust and Genocide Studies, and Dr. Bart van der Boom of Leiden University. We have Dr. Petra van den Boomgaard of Utrecht University College, and she is the leading specialist on Kalmeyer and the attempts to Aryanize Jews during the war. We have Dr. Raymond Schutz of the Hague Municipal Archives, who is specialized in the role of notaries during the Second World War. While Aldrich Hermans is the local expert on, on hiding of Jews in the Gooi area. And finally, I myself, I'm a professor of Jewish studies, specialized in the modern history of Amsterdam Jewry. We've all read each other's chapters, commented on it, and asked for peer review. Each chapter discusses an other element in the argumentation of the court case team. The report we present today will be available to everyone, open access, free of charge in English and um, in Dutch. You may find it, among others, at the websites of SPUI 25, the NIOT, and the Manasseh Ben Israel Institute. Now, let me have a brief look at the argument developed by the court case team, as written down in um, Rosemary Sullivan's book. The overall goal is formulated very clearly at the beginning of the Dutch edition of the book. The fact that the mystery of who betrayed the location of the secret annex, triggered, triggering the raid on the 4th of August 1944, has not been solved, and this was deemed to be very unsatisfactory. Previous investigations led to a variety of theories about the betrayal of the secret annex, with several individuals named as possible perpetrators. None of these theories has been proven um, um, uh, as yet, according to the court case team. And therefore, it argued that it was high time for a breakthrough. And this would be achieved by treating the betrayal of the annex as a court case. 
which could be solved with forensic methods. Now, the first part of the book assesses the different scenarios and critically examines the arguments of previous authors. And this exercise provides new information on certain aspects of the persecution of Jews in Amsterdam. In the final section of the book, the cold case team develops its own theory based on the last remaining scenario. In this scenario, the Jewish notary Arnold van den Berg is identified as the most likely betrayer of the secret annex. And in the same breath of numerous other hiding places. Van der Berg is briefly introduced in Rosemary Sullivan's book as one of several Jewish notaries operating in pre-war Amsterdam and the owner of, I quote, one of the largest and most successful notary businesses in the city. He is char characterized as a wealthy man, cunning, clever, and during the wartime occupation as Goudstikker's notary and as a member of the Jewish Council, successful in establishing connections with, and I quote, powerful Nazis. Because of these powerful contacts in the Nazi hierarchy, he secured Kalmeyer status for himself. Again, according to the court case team. He is identified as the betrayer of the secret annex and all these other hiding places. The book paints a picture of Van der Berg as someone, and I quote, someone put into a devil's dilemma by circumstances for which he was not to blame, and who, under pressure, may have failed to understand fully the consequences of his actions. End of quote. He's claimed to have committed the betrayal, not and I quote again, out of wickedness or for self-enrichment, end of quote, but to save his family. The restraint exercised to some extent earlier in the book, when pointing the finger at Van den Berg as the traitor, disappears in the final pages. I quote again, he saved his family by giving up addresses, including 263 Prinsengracht, to the Sicherheitsdienst. And a few paragraphs later, I quote, that he succeeded while Otto failed is a terrible fact of history. End of quote. Fact of history. In the report we present today, we have scrutinized central elements of the argumentation presented in the betrayal of Anne Frank. In doing so, we have focused on the case of Van den Berg. Our conclusion in this report is that the accusation does not hold water. Our counter arguments focus on two aspects. Firstly, criticism of the court case team's method and approach. And secondly, criticism of the factual content of their historical reconstruction. The court case team adopts a forensic method, approaching the historical case of the betrayal of the secret annex as a court case. However, the use of this method does not justify completely disregarding the most basic of scientific and academic preconditions. Anyone investigating a historical case needs to be well versed in the broader historical context in order to properly in interpret sources and testimonies. A researcher who wants to do proper justice to the past must additionally consider and weigh up all the possible perspectives. Great care must be exercised, particularly when deceased persons are involved who can no longer defend themselves. In Sullivan's book, book we see three areas where significant mistakes are made. The first area of concern is the use of sources. 
apart from the fact that the annotation in the book is sparse and regularly found to be inaccurate, analysis of the original sources shows that the cold case team often read them sloppily and poorly, applied little critical judgment when analyzing them, and either did not contextualize them or only made a half-hearted attempt at doing so. Even the content of the most important piece of evidence, the portentous note, is not unraveled, and the detective's notes on it are either erroneously interpreted or ignored. The historical context of the Second World War and the immediate post-war period is frequently misunderstood. For example, the court case team is under the mistaken assumption that successfully filing a Kalmeyer application required influential connections. And later on, they consider the fact that Van der Berg also knew people in the underground as suspicious. That Van den Berg survived the war and was not put in a camp is again seen as, a, as an expression of privilege and a possible indication of treason. Taking this point of view to its logical conclusion would mean that anyone who went into hiding, hiding is suspicious. In reality, going into hiding was just another way of trying to save your life. And even then, the risk of being betrayed or discovered was still significant. So, um, there's no privilege there. Because the court case team does not have a clear picture of the Jewish council, it does not see how implausible the accusation of mass betrayal is. Furthermore, when assessing the notes um, and hence statement, it also fails to properly factor in the post-war context of an Amsterdam that was sweltering with gossip, accusations and rumors of treason. Secondly, the argument does not stack up. The entire body of evidence in the Van den Berg case is built on presuppositions which are initially launched as hypotheses and with some nuance, but subsequently assumed to be true. For example, on page 259, the granddaughter is claimed to have said that if her grandfather was indeed guilty of the betrayal, it could only have been to save the life of his wife and daughters. That option becomes a fact for the cold case team a little later. And I quote, he saved his life, his, his family, by giving up addresses to the Sicherheitsdienst. The fact that individuals such as Miriam Boller and the granddaughter know little about Van den Berg is used by the cold case team in the argumentation in order to position its own theory that the granddaughter at least according to the court case team, did not know whether Van den Berg and his wife had gone into hiding, is used to insinuate that they therefore had a secret that should not be revealed to others. This is just one of the examples where an argumentum a silencio is used in the book. Thirdly, it should be no noted that the court case team exhibits tunnel vision. In contrast to the earlier scenarios which are dissected and analyzed with great critical verve, it appears that the opposite is perfectly acceptable when looking at the last scenario. Van den Berg is guilty unless proven otherwise. Only those elements of sources were used that could support their own theory. Anything pointing the other way has been omitted or disregarded. Source information originating from Nazi, Nazis and collaborators is adopted without much um, in the way of critical analysis, while sources favorable to Van den Berg are brushed aside or do not appear in the book at all. 
This leads to framing. And step by step, an image of Van der Berg emerges as a clever and cunning Jewish notary with high-ranking Nazi connections who commits unthinkable treason at the decisive moment. This picture is the result of an accumulation of faulty assumptions and careless use of sources. In addition to pointing out the errors in the argumentation and use of sources, this report also presents a historical reconstruction of Arnold van den Berg's actions and his role within the Jewish Council. This shows that the accusation of betrayal, A, does not match the picture of his personality that emerges from the sources. And B, is based on the erroneous assumption of the existence of lists of hiding addresses within the Jewish Council. And C, does not fit with the timeline of Van der Berg's actions during the war. The war period is too often studied separately from the pre-war period and the post-war periods. The case of Van den Berg shows how important it is to see the continuity between them. His pre-war profile as a family man, a notary, and a board member of Jewish care institutions is an important key to understanding the wartime phase and the post-war period. Due to the close ties within his family, Van der Berg helps his relatives as much as possible during the war. And these networks also play an important role later when Van den Berg's family goes into hiding. As a notary, he put his expertise to good use during the war and, as this report establishes, he helped other Jews fraudulently claim Aryan descent via his office. These strategies to evade and counter German policies also fit in with the wartime characterization of Van der Berg as someone who was fiercely anti-Nazi. His commitment to Jewish social care explains why he became a member of the Jewish Council and continued to fulfill his responsibilities from that position. After the war, he again worked as a notary for much of the Jewish community, along with his colleague Speer and his wartime partner, Marseille. He also immediately resumed his social welfare work on behalf of the Jewish community. The cold case team claims that Van der Berg had knowledge, motive and opportunity and therefore betrayed the secret annex and numerous other addresses. This report shows that every element of these claims is based on misuse of sources and unsound reasoning. Knowledge. According to the court case team, it is, and I quote, almost certain that the Jewish council had lists of addresses where Jews were in hiding, end of quote to which Van der Berg, in turn, would have had access through his key position. Those alleged lists of hiders' addresses were based on the note, the, the famous note. Um, on the note, on Hens testimony, the Pollock case, and finally a report on the contact department in Westerbork. These are four very disparate sources, written at different times and also appear to relate to different issues. 
The accusation in the note and hence statement, our report argues, is to be seen in the context of widespread rumors about the Jewish Council, which Nazis and collaborators used to try to shift as much responsibility as possible to Jews and thus exonerate themselves. In post-war criminal cases, however, this accusation of large-scale betrayal by the Jewish Council has not been accepted as credible in any of the procedures. Furthermore, war criminals such as Willy Lages and Ferdinand Ausdefunden did not use this argument in their defenses, although it would have been very helpful for them. The Pollock case is actually about an illegal worker who kept a personal card index of addresses he had contact with as an illegal worker, as was common in underground circles. As far as is known, this was in no way related to the Jewish Council. And finally, the report on the contact committee makes no mention at all of lists of addresses where Jews were thought to be hiding. The whole theory about the lists of hiding is not, I quote Sullivan, almost certainly accurate in actual fact. It is based on misreading of the sources and connections with information that is not related in any way. So there is no knowledge. Now, is there a motive, perhaps? According to the cold case team, Van den Berg's motive was, and I quote again, to safeguard himself and his family from capture and deportation by making himself useful to the Nazi occupiers. Now, quite apart from the fact that this making himself useful to the Nazi occupiers is not substantiated anywhere in the book, the motive is completely absent. This report shows conclusively that his children had been in hiding since October 1943. Van den Berg had arranged jobs for his daughters and two of his nieces at the Dutch Israelite Hospital. This provided them with a sperre that temporarily kept them from deportation. In the hospital, they met the German communist and resistance fighter Albert Schlösser. With um, um, with whom one of the, the nieces, Hester van den Berg, started a relationship. When in October 1943, the protection of the existing Sperren was endangered by a Nazi collaborator, um, that was the moment um, uh, when van den Berg um, brought his daughters into hiding, assisted by Schlösser. The fact that Van den Berg knew his children were safe contradicts the elite's motive that he acted to save his family, because his family was safe. If anything, then, the motive could have been to ensure his own survival and that of his wife, Auguste. But they also went into hiding from February 1944, at the latest. At January the 4th, Van der Berg was warned that an arrest warrant was issued for him, as he was suspected of fraud in relation to his Aryanization. It was again Schlösser who helped him out. The twin daughters of Van den Berg wrote down in a testimony in 1978 that the parents joined the two of them in their hiding place in the village of Laren. The exact location of their hiding place, Leemkeil 11, is established by the diary of a neighbor, Gerard Huysen. He had a Jewish wife himself and was therefore trusted by the lady of the house and the Van den Berg family. 
On the 11th of March, 1945, he wrote down that he had visited the Van den Berg family at his neighbor's house. And I quote, they are a married couple with two daughters. A younger daughter is still in Brabant in the now liberated area. They are very friendly and cultured people. End of quote. All this makes the betrayal on the part of Van den Berg highly unlikely. If he had provided those address lists in February 1944, around the time he went into hiding, the Nazis would have raided the secret annex and other locations at that time. However, if disclosure of the addresses took place in August 1944, he would have had to come out of hiding to do this. But why would someone leave the relative safety of a hiding place to betray others when there was no actual motive for doing so? Because he, his children and his wife were already in hiding. To sum up, there's no motive. Now, is there an opportunity? The court case team claims that Van den Berg had the opportunity for the betrayal because he had, and I quote, freedom to move about and access to the Sicherheitsdienst, end of quote. This refers firstly to his Kalmeyer status and secondly suggests regular contact with highly placed Nazis. Now, Van den Berg had indeed managed to obtain Kalmeyer status. But, contrary to the court case team's assertion, this did not require contacts with high-ranking Nazis. There is no evidence that Van den Berg had any such contacts during the entire process. And the protection that should have given him was also lacking when his fraud was discovered and his Kalmeyer st status was revoked. The theory of Nazi connections is also based on the Goudsticker case, in which he appears to have played a technical role. As the former notary of the company and the Goudsticker family, he endeavors to help the widow Goudsticker get through the war. These endeavors brought him into contact with Alois Middel, a shadowy figure who profited from the Nazi regime, but also helped people. The book suggests an amical relationship between the two, but this is not supported by any of the sources. Furthermore, Middel disappears from the Netherlands in July 1944. Ben van der Berg is already in hiding. The claim that van der Berg had direct contact with the Reich Chancellery in Berlin and sold a painting to Hitler is pure invention. There's not even one source for this. Van der Berg also had no contact with high-ranking Nazis as a member of the Jewish Council, as he was responsible for social care in this body. The book offers no proof of any contact between Van den Berg and the Amsterdam Sicherheitsdienst or other prominent figures in the Nazi hierarchy. And our resource, research has also not revealed um, evidence uh, of this nature. To cut a long story short, Van den Berg could not move freely from January, February 1944 because a search and capture warrant had been issued against him. And he also did not have easy access to the Sicherheitsdienst. In view of the above, opportunity is also refuted. To conclude, the court case team has turned the betrayal of the secret annex into a thrilling court case. Unfortunately, it's clear that the argumentation does not hold up. And due to misinterpretation and tunnel vision, 
the investigation wrongly identifies Arnold van den Berg as Anne Frank's betrayer. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's time for questions now. Uh, if you ask a question, please stand up and tell your name. And the research team, of course, will answer all your questions. So is there a question anywhere in the room? Yes, behind. Please stand up. Shall we bring the microphone as well? There is a mic in the mid. Okay. about the, the list, uh, does the, the cold case team argue how the Prinzengracht 263 did come on that list? Because as far as I know, the Otto Frank and his uh, workers didn't give the names to anyone else or the address to anyone else. So how, if that list exists, the Prinzengracht would have been on that list. Is that argumentated with evidence or not? Who would like to answer this? Okay, so your question is if uh, such list existed, yes. whether Prinzengracht uh, would have been on that list? Yeah. No, no evidence is provided by the cold case team as to uh, okay. that question. No, that's okay. a simple answer. I don't need to elaborate, I suppose. Okay, thank you. Next question, please. Yes. And um, please tell your name as well. So, uh, yeah, my name is uh, Fritz Kutzer. I think we know each other. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have two questions. Um, did the cold case team investigate um, uh, whether the person uh, sending this or having written this anonymous uh, notice about Vail, whether he could have, uh, he or she or whatever it was, or a child maybe, what a motive could have been of uh, this person to cast uh, suspicions on Mr. Van der Meer. I would have supposed that, I would suppose that, I haven't read the book, but I would suppose that the cold case team would have gone into an investigation of such possible motives. Second question is, uh, I also had, I asked a question of Suus Perifaitintunder. Uh, the the, the, the so-called use of the Bayesian statistics, um, which as far as I understand, uh, that the team made a very strange use of it. This is a notorious, very dangerous, uh, we know it very well from in Holland, from the Lucia van der Ber uh, Berg, uh, van Berg case, uh, who was uh, suspected of all the seven uh, murders and there was a big, uh, a big confrontation on the techniques used and so it's a very hazardous thing to use techniques like these. So I understand there has been also been a lot of criticism in the way the team uh, applied the so-called these Bayesian statistics. So have you, has, have you also investigated this aspect of the, of the, of the book? Okay, those two were my questions for the moment. I think Bart van der Boom could answer these questions very well. Um, I hope so. Um, your first question is, did the cold case team investigate the possible motives of the writer of this anonymous note? Um, um, the, the answer is no, because it's unclear who wrote the note. He remains, or she remains anonymous, but the assumption on the part of the cold case team is that this is someone who had knowledge that he wanted to divulge. Um, while, <clears throat> of course, there's a very uh, simple explanation for such a note, namely that someone wanted uh, Otto Frank to believe that Mr. van den Berg had been a traitor or that he himself believed that Mr. Frank had been a traitor. But the crucial fact which the cold case team misses is that in the post-war years, such accusations were very common. Lots of people were trying to whitewash their own uh, past or were trying to settle accounts with others. So there were lots of wild accusations going around. Um, so I think their major mistake is that they think this is something very special that such a note exists while well, it's not that unusual. Um, your second question is on the Bayesian statistics. 
I'm no expert on this, but as far as I understand it, um, the way it works is that you um, provide facts and a certain likelihood of facts, and then you can actually calculate if it could be coincidental that these different facts coincide at the same time. So if this and this and this and this is true, what is the chance that we have our man? Um, so I guess this works if you can attach a certain chance to certain factors, but of course you can't in this case. So it only, uh, I mean, it, what comes out is what you put in. Um, so I don't see how this could in any way help us because a statistical program cannot tell us if a witness is reliable or not. Is there another question? Yes. My name is Jaap van Wiesel. Since this is in English for an international audience, it might be helpful if you clarify who exact uh, Mr. Kalmeyer was and what his function was uh, during, during the war. Petra van der Boogaard is a specialist on this topic, so we are... Yeah, I, 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 I refer you to the uh, document that we're uh, um, sharing uh, with the audience. Um, I did research on the Kalmeyer cases, so the, the revision cases, and I explain in this chapter three exactly how this procedure worked, um, what was needed to get an, uh, yeah, to, to get an, uh, an revision in the head, so this, to, to get a status that's less Jewish, that you ended up with a less Jewish status and that you were able to survive. You want to interrupt or? Oh, perhaps you can first explain what, why the pr procedure was there and how it worked. So not many, not all, every. Yeah, okay, so, no, yeah, that's what I was saying in, in the chapter three, the, the exact procedure is being explained, but I will try to do it right yeah, here. here. Yeah, here. So uh, everyone who was Jewish in the Netherlands um, was required by the Nazis to register, to register as Jewish. And this, this started in uh, January 1941, uh, so everyone who had Jewish grandparents who, who, or who was a member of the synagogue uh, was basically forced to register, to register themselves. Um, what did the Nazis uh, came up with was this idea that, okay, but maybe someone is making a mistake, then there should be somehow an escape clause. Eh? So if, if, because the, the ultimate goal of the Nazis was to identify who was Jewish and who in the end uh, needed to be deported. So what they did after um, yeah, having experience basically in Nazi Germany, they organized this uh, sub, sub, sub uh, department within uh, the occupied forces where someone could apply um, and it could request a revision of the Jewish status. And this was, as I said, to, um, yeah, to, to basically doubt uh, the fact that they first registered as Jewish in January 41, but then, uh, well, there were, could, could have been certain reasons why they weren't. Now, this, of course, was an escape clause, and uh, the cold case presents uh, the case of Arnold van den Berg as um, yeah, an incidental type of situation. Um, and, well, I did research on um, all the revision cases that there were basically in the Netherlands, and then we're talking about 5,000 to 6,000 people who tried this, this, tried this way of evading uh, the deportations. Um, yeah, and in the end I proved that uh, approximately 3,000 3, people who registered as Jewish in 1941 were able to survive. So basically, had this whole Kalmeyer procedure was one of the options. That's something else that I'm writing down. That's only one of the options to evade the deportations. So it was, it was not unique. Um, it was commonly known during the war. And you needed, um, in order to get a, 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 a demand uh, uh, rewarded, you needed an, an, uh, a good lawyer, but also a notary. To, have, have the, to come up with the right evidence and to prove that indeed that you, uh, that you have made a mistake and that you weren't Jewish. And there were all kinds of uh, ways to do this, but in the case of Van den Berg, well, he, he, he claimed that, um, so I'm almost done, sorry, he claimed that um, 
that there was um, an, a case of an extramarital affair, and this is why, um, yeah, yeah, somehow he didn't know about this, and this is why he, there was a mistake. And in the end of the day, he wasn't Jewish, but he was only a quarter Jew. And by that fact, his daughters became half Jewish, and his wife was married to a quarter Jew. And that, that entitled her also to stay in the Netherlands, basically, because she was married to an Aryan, quote unquote. <laughs> but in the end, it didn't work. That's and in the end, it didn't work, but that was actually an exception. And the, and the reason why it didn't work, because there was this uh, assistant notary who, yeah, he, who came after the notary office of Van den Berg, who wanted to work in that office. And he really made a case of proving that there was fraud. And um, he went all the way, he talked at all the levels within the occupying force, and um, yeah, that helped. It was very successful, because in the end of the day, Karl Mayer had to, had to revise uh, the original decision. And yeah, at that point in time, and that, that's actually also another claim of the uh, cold case team, at that point in time, uh, there was this lawyer working at the uh, Entscheidungsstelle, had this department of Karl Mayer, who overheard had, what was going on, and he, this guy, this, this, this lawyer, who worked with the resistance, was able to warn the, the Van den Berg family in time. So that's what happened. So immediately thereafter, they went in hiding. And that's a very Absolutely. important fact yes. as that's well. That's a fact, yeah. Are there other questions? Okay, yes. Hello, my name is uh, Sidi Smeets. Uh, first of all, let me compliment you on this airtight uh, refutation because it's amazing and I think it's, it's, uh, it's impossible for the people who wrote the book to, to um, uh, give you any, um, any harassment about it because it's, it's just airtight. Um, but I do have a question about the uh, provenance of the note. Uh, you mentioned there might be a possible motive, of course, for people after the war to, to uh, slander someone. Uh, but is there in the note or on the note any evidence or any uh, suggestion about its provenance? Might it be uh, faked or might it be someone who doesn't actually know what he's pretending to know? Bart van der Boom is the one to answer this question, I think. Um, um, well, actually, I mean, there are very few clues on the note. Uh, an important clue, I think, and a clue which, amazingly, the Cold Came team miss it, missed while they think this note is very important and it's the, the crucial piece of evidence, um, is that the writer of the note uses a very odd uh, way to indicate the Zentralstelle für Jüdische Auswanderung, um, the, the institution where supposedly these lists of people in hiding had been, had been deposited. Um, and he also thinks that the Zentralstelle was located on the Uterpestraat while it was located opposite on the Adama van Scheltema plan. Um, so the assumption by the cold case team is that the writer of the note was actually an insider, someone who knew about the Zentralstelle who might actually have worked there, while these si small mistakes in the note show that it cannot have been an insider because he would not have mistaken the address of the Zentralstelle if he worked there. So as far as what we can tell from the note is that this is probably not someone who was familiar with the workings of the Sicherheitspolizei, but aside from that, we know nothing. Um, that is problematic and, of course, um, diminishes the credibility of the note. Then there is the date of the note, which is very complicated. Um, uh, Otto Frank has said, that that's clear, that he received it shortly after the liberation. That's what he said in 1963 or that's what a police officer reported him saying in 1963. We don't know what he or the police officer meant by shortly after the war at that point. I mean, that could have been 1945, it could have been 1946, or perhaps even 1947. We simply don't know. There is no clear way of dating it. While that does make a big mistake, because in April of 1946, the first publicity about Anne Frank's diary was generated. So if it had been written after, April 1946, it's even less believable than if it was written before 1946. Um, and, and lastly, the cold case team makes a very odd mistake saying that um, the person who wrote the note must have had inside information, must have been very well connected because he knew, one, that um, people had been 
caught at the Prince Rach 263 and someone had returned, um, that two, uh, there was this notary called Arnold van den Berg, and that three, that there had been lists at the Sicherheitspolizei. Now the last, of course, doesn't follow at all. Uh, the only thing that the note, note writer had to know was one that Otto Frank had returned, which must have been known in the neighborhood at least, and he must have known who Van den Berg was, because he mentions Van den Berg and he mentions his wartime address. But Van den Berg was a very well-known man. So this does not require any intimate knowledge. So there's no real reason to attach particular um, importance to this, to this note. Thank you. I saw another question in the back. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, my name is Geert van Werkhoven. I'm a student at the NIOT. Um, thank you for this refutation. And, but my question to all of you is, what should happen now? What is, in your opinion, the correct way to cor correct this now? Um, yeah, I, I, I can... I can. Um, well, the, the court case team itself said um, had that they published their theory um, and um, they did so that in case new evidence would turn up, they would be so frank to retract. So um, I think what we have done right now is to give new evidence um, and I think the court case team is invited to keep its word now. Um, and to do what it said, basically. We've got still time for a few questions. Yes, please. My name is Harry Mock from Amfora. I uh, really want to um, say that new evidence is lacking. And if I see the last 10 years, we have seen the book of Dr. Barnau without a conclusion. We have seen the onderzoeksverslag in zaken verraad en arrestatie van de onderduikers in het Achterhuis bij de Anne Frank Stichting uh, uh, researcher Dr. Gert-Jan Broek. Also without anything. So this book is again uh, the same subject without new evidence. How you look at it from above and beneden I don't see any new evidence, sorry. And uh, when I s make a citation from the publication of, you also the, have a Dutch, question. of the Dutch uh, publisher, they say nothing about the conclusion, but they are, uh, only have all compliments about the historians, criminology, data wetenschappers, forensic experts, journalists, politie medewerkers, to impress the people, but I'm not impressed, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? Yeah? David Barno. Yeah, is there a microphone or shall I bring it to you? Yeah, come on. <coughs> sorry, two remarks. Uh, our book uh, made by uh, Gerald van der Stroom and me was 2003, that's more than 20 years ago. Uh, and it took us half a page to say that Van der Berg was not the traitor. Um, but the question about uh, the note, um, Van Maren, uh, uh, that was one of the main suspects, has been interviewed uh, and in 47, 48, and then nobody talked about the note. So talking about when Otto Frank got a note is very difficult. There's also the question if Gringhuis, a uh, police officer, told that Otto Frank uh, had told he had a note. Um, I think we will never know exactly when it was, but it was not just after the war. Otherwise, they would have used it in the case against uh, uh, Gringhuis. Thank you very much. Are there other questions? Yes. Uh, my name is Saskia Goldschmidt and I thank you very, very much for the work you all have done because I was so shocked when I heard about the, as, as everyone and I was very happy to have so much good um, 
contra information uh, published very soon and also this report. And I wonder, do you have any idea about uh, what is the role of anti-Semitism in this whole case? <laughs> Interesting question. Important as well. I think Mirjam de Gorter will say something about it. I, I, I would now like to say something yeah. about it. Um, what, what I uh, actually noticed while reading the book is that there, uh, in the whole narrative, there is a staging of this notary Vandenberg as someone who is, uh, in fact, a, a, a person without ethics, a person who wants money, a person who is a pragmatist in circumstances, a person who is, a, who wants to, so he's, he's getting a very negative persona in, in the book, and that is actually, when I read it, I see that this is a, a kind of uh, anti-Semitist uh, 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 profile that is being uh, uh, made there. And even in the end of the book, there is this uh, statement by the writer, Mrs. Rosemary Sullivan, uh, who actually says that he becomes ill, Mr. 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 Vandenberg, and it's almost presented as some kind of punishment from above. And that is also a kind of Christian anti-Semitism that I, that I point in there. So uh, in, in that case, it, 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 I, I read it as an anti-Semitist uh, pamphlet. That's what it is. Says Raymond Schutz, who wrote a huge dissertation on the history of notary during the Second World War. Any questions? Yeah, behind. My name is uh, Karin Stevensen, and I have a question for the team about all the other aspects in the book um, that are being treated and have, well, to say the least, flaws in it. Has there been some research, some research concerning that? Because if you draw the line from those uh, flaws and, fa and fails, um, you can also argue that the big argument, the big story might be uh, flawed simply from the line of reasoning they use. Is my, is my question uh, clear? Has that been researched? I know my English is uh, flowing uh, around. Yeah, maybe I could respond to it. So, um, as you said, indeed, we focused on this uh, persona, Arnold van der Berg, but it is the essence of the book. Right, so it is the essence of the book we focused on, and if you look at the the book uh, in its entirety, of course, that should that could be a next step to take. You should maybe look at the the, the book in in um, in all its aspects. But I think it is important to emphasize that this is the center of the book, and that we really try to debunk also the line of argumentation. And you see similar lines of argumentation throughout the book um, as well. So maybe uh, that is a response to to your question, that it is um, indeed not the entire book we focused on, but it is the essence of the book. Is there are no questions anymore? There is a question, okay, please. Dutch publisher Anto, Ant, uh, Ambo Antos reacted and made a, but apologized in fact. But did you have reactions already from Harper Collins? Collins, how is this going to influence the wide world debate? Question of Dirk Jan Snell, historian. Has there been any contact with Harper Collins? Um, no, but, but of course we, we hope that uh, the, the publishers, uh, HarperCollins in the United States and in Germany and on many other locations, that they will very carefully read this report. And um, I, I think that we as, as researchers are, are more than happy if they have any questions to, um, to help them reach their conclusions. Um, so I, I really hope, and that's also one of the reasons why we do this in English, um, uh, um, uh, that um, uh, the United States, that Canada, 
um, hey, we'll, um, uh, we'll read this carefully and um, we'll, we'll weigh the arguments uh, and um, that um, had this book, which is still um, um, a, a major success in the Anglophone world, um, hey, that people will realize that there are um, very important questions to be asked. Important is also that the, uh, the German historians, various uh, important German historians, took distance of the book and were very critical uh, about it. And that's the reason why the publisher Harper Collins Deutschland uh, did not publish it, but is, is still thinking about rewriting the book and publishing it later. Uh, but I expect that particularly the German historians will be very critical about it and that they are doubting about publishing this book and I hope this evening will help them to stop thinking about it. Yes. Um, <clears throat> my name is Sam Scheich. Uh, I've got a question regarding um, your research. Uh, is it also being shown to the Gemeente Amsterdam, who I understood has uh, provided subsidy for the writing of this book of, I think, 100,000 euros. And will that be passed back or? Um, well, uh, of course, the, the, the municipality, the city of Amsterdam uh, will respond to this. I think if, if journalists go and ask questions to the city, uh, of course, they, they will uh, respond to this. But I know that the city is very carefully following this as well. and. Uh, I'm, I'm really sure that this report will help them as well in their uh, uh, decision process. Yes, two last questions. Hello, my name is Tamar Stern. I wanted to ask, um, because I, it seems so odd to me, but I don't know, maybe the historians know to how to answer it. How, uh, was it known that the Jewish committee had lists of people who were in hiding? Because so many tre treacheries has, has been come out and it's, it's late, eh? 1944. So it seems very odd to me to think that there would lay or, or be a, around the committee lists of people who were in hiding. And just one funny thing is, that the lame cow number 11 actually <laughs> was where my other non-Jewish grandmother uh, lived later and I've been very many times have been there in that house. <laughs> Lawin. Yeah, so um, I think as we, we uh, Bart Valette has already argued, but we argue very carefully in the report as well, is that there is no evidence that such lists indeed exist. So both uh, Bart van Boom and myself, as well as many other historians, have um, carefully studied the archives of the Jewish Council and we've never come across such lists. Uh, we neither have come across mentioning of such lists apart from uh, a few post-war statements such as the one that is um, brought up by the cold case team. So the, so the uh, um, translator Hen, who uh, indicates that he heard someone else saying that the Jewish Council uh, possessed such lists, but of course that is pure hearsay, and we, we argue very uh, carefully in, in the report as well that his statement is uh, motivated by, uh, or that he has ulterior motives uh, by making this statement. So the, the cold case team really says we, we take this statement as fa at face value because he doesn't have any reasons to argue or to state that the Jewish council possessed such lists, but we uh, claim that in fact he had other motives. He did want to uh, show the Jewish council in a bad light. And the other two um, pieces of evidence that the cold case team refers to I think Bart Vallet already explained it, but I will shortly repeat it, is indeed the, uh, the mentioning of uh, lists at the contact afdeling in Westerbork, so transit camp uh, Westerbork in the, in the north of the country. Uh, the cold case team says that uh, the, this contact afdeling possessed lists of Jews in hiding, and this contact afdeling was a sub-department of the Jewish Council. But we uh, consulted the archives ourselves, I, I consulted the archive myself, and I didn't find any mention of such lists, so it's pure invention. It's really like a, an, a, an attribution uh, or uh, an adding 
of uh, this specific reference to a list that would, was made by uh, the cold case team. And then last, of course, what the cold case team claims is that there was this Rudolf Pollack who, um, who supposedly had lists of people in hiding. And indeed, there is a slight reference to the fact that when he was arrested, so he was uh, a bit of a shady figure who was in no way can be compared to the figure of Arnold van den Berg. Um, and he engaged in all kinds of clandestine activities and at, such, at some point he was arrested and then indeed in his house there was a, a list found of people in hiding but that is in no way connected to his work for the Jewish Council. In fact, it is related to his clandestine activities. He provided, uh, um, he, he provided new um, identity cards for, for Jews, for example, who were in hiding. So that's where these lists uh, came from. So not at all uh, from the Jewish Council. So these are really the three pieces of evidence that the cold case team uh, brings up. And um, all of them are, are in no way show that indeed um, the Jewish Council had such lists. Yes, please. My name is uh, Jan Willem Hensling, or Jan Hensling in English. Um, in the discussion of the refutation, I understand that for the timing, it's important to know when Van der Berg was in hiding, undercover. How is it possible then that uh, we don't know exactly where he was in hiding, where we uh, suppose in Leiden, because what I remember from my mother, from her sister, they know exactly who was in hiding in their houses at any time. So people should know who the name of the people were who were living there. So that's something I'm puzzling about. I think it has to do something with the investigative research, which had limited, uh, which had some limitations. I think they didn't want to know it, perhaps, or yeah, it's about hiding. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Hanfling, thank you for your, for your question. Um, uh, the idea of hiding uh, was, of course, uh, an idea uh, to get under the radar. And the idea was that as few people, uh, that as few people as possible should know where you were. That's a general idea of getting into hiding. Um, during the war, um, uh, the Vandenberg daughters uh, got into contact uh, during their time in the hospital uh, with a resistance man from Lyron uh, called Albert Schlosser, like, um, uh, like was mentioned earlier. And, and this man helped uh, the uh, Vandenberg family through the war uh, every time to new uh, uh, hiding addresses. Uh, I'm not sure what your question is exactly, but um, maybe you can the help. The problem is that they seem to be that didn't want to know exactly these facts because it didn't fit in the theory. Just a simple fact. If you have someone in your house, you know his name. So after the war, those people were still living and the, 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 the landlord was still living in the, in the home. So he should Oh, that's your question. Um, yes, very often, um, the people who, um, who allowed you in their house uh, knew who you were. Uh, but as often, uh, people had false identity cards. So um, it must be clear that when you went into hiding without false identity papers, the people who gave you hiding were in great trouble after uh, after the house was raided so um, everybody tried uh, uh, to get hiding papers uh, 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 identity papers without a g uh, so uh, the hiding family wouldn't uh, be uh, uh, in trouble uh, when the house would be raided can i, yeah. can I say something because you are talking about what people knew at the time but the problem is what is actually to be found in the sources and 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 the sources are usually created many years after the war and that means that the 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 memory of people and the names and dates 
are, are, are in, in many cases are, are not um, uh, noted down or not known. And maybe at the time people knew much more than they actually told in 1978 to uh, the, the poor uh, correspondent for their uh, for their uh, for their uh, uh, applying for uh, for uh, for restitution or whatever. So that is the problem that you have as historians with hiding places. Hiding places. Yes, at the time there was a lot of knowledge in people's memory. Certainly, people who were part of the resistance didn't write things down. They knew things, and that memory of the time is lost over time. And I think that in this case we have been able to really reconstruct quite a lot of uh, Van der Berg's uh, whereabouts. And, uh, but it's, of course it's, it's not optimal. Uh, it, he didn't have a mobile phone uh, showing uh, every, every, every uh, geological place where he was so, so on GPS. So that's, that's the problem you have with historical uh, research in those kinds of uh, cases. I forgot something, and I want to quote Miriam Bolle from Jerusalem. She is the only living testimony from the Yod Serat. She is 103 or 4. I just came back from Israel and I talked to her. Many people talked to her. In the book, she is mentioned, but she downplayed her own role in the Yod Serat. If you see the book, the researchers didn't talk to her too much, and they didn't took the conclusions. But there is evidence that she had a much more outstanding role then. And after my conversation, she said, Harry, there is one quote from David Cohen, the chairman of the Jewish uh, Raad, that you need to know. The quote is, als iemand over onderduik aan mij vraagt, dan zeg ik, het woord onderduik komt niet in mijn vocabulaire voor. That's the answer of the list of onderduikers. No list at all. Thank you very much. I think it's time for Miriam de Gorter to give her address to the authors of the book. Good evening, everybody here. I am happy to be here. First of all, I would like to express my deepest gratitude to the authors of the report just presented for the expert and professional work. It is thanks to them that I am able to tell my story here today. I did not want to go public in the media until knowledgeable schoolers had reviewed the book. Now this important and sensitive piece of wartime history is being done justice on both scientific and historical grounds. This creates room for open discussion based on facts and arguments. I therefore wholeheartedly endorse this refutation of the book, which is meticulous, nuanced, and above all, giving truthful facts and context. This case is not about me, but about the whole context of the story in which, out of the blue, my grandfather Arnold van den Berg has been portrayed worldwide as a Jewish scapegoat. Moreover, Anne Frank's international prominence as a symbol of the Holocaust is exploited in a particularly dishonest way. Before I go any further into how I got involved in regard to this book and the impact it has had on me, I want to emphasize the following four points. Firstly, Rosemary Sullivan, the author of the book, along with the self-appointed cold case team of Vince Pankoek, Thijs Bayens and Peter van Twisk, come out with their own formulation of what I allegedly said. 
I never said I agreed with their conclusions. I never said that my grandfather had to save his family and would have committed treason for that reason. I never said that I would have sympathized with that. After all, he did not engage in that betrayal. Secondly, I strongly reject the theory in the book that my grandfather probably was the betrayer of Anne Frank and additionally of many other, many other people. Thirdly, the authors make a wrong turn at the end of the book, that is, when my grandfather is depicted as the traitor, now with 100% certainty. Moreover, they attach a moral judgment to their conclusion. My grandfather's so-called choices are set off against those of Otto Frank. In my opinion, this is a profoundly immoral way of thinking. Fourthly, in chapter 40 on granddaughter, the interviews are participated in during the preliminary investigation are exploited as an attribute in the accusation against my grandfather. In the following chapters, that image is reinforced. I therefore strongly reject the way my family and I have been portrayed in the book. At this point, I would like to discuss my interactions with the team. In March 2018, Thijs Bayens requested to talk with me what I know about my family during the war years. In an email dated March 2nd, he tells me that he currently is researching the circumstances of going into hiding in the Gooi area particularly. The following is a quote from his email. As you can see on our website, a selected group of very reputable scholars is involved in this research on the betrayal of Anne Frank. We are working in good faith with the Anne Frank House, the NIOT, Institute for War, Holocaust and Genocide Studies, and the National Archives, among others. Respect for the people involved in the research and the discovery of the truth are of a paramount importance. On March 6th, I replied to his email. I had to think about your question. One's family history is a very intimate perception. Therefore, I clearly want to know where the information will end up. The information I may have needs to be checked carefully for accuracy. Thijs wrote back on March 8th, saying that it is very wise for me to be careful about providing information. I quote, one should not do that carelessly. I can assure you that your information will be handled with discretion within this investigation. And, of course, we always check everything thoroughly. The conversation took place on March 15th, now four years ago. I was open to contributing to authentic research on the history of war. As best as I could, I recounted what I knew at the time. I was very young when my family talked about the war. Many details, such as a timeline, were missing. Although the war always was present at home, there was very little talk about it. In February 2019, I had a conversation with Vince Pancoke and Brandon Roak. Vince was very interested in whether my grandfather had been pressured or interrogated. This never was, was discussed in the family. Finally, he showed me that anonymous note naming my grandfather as the traitor. That was a very shocking moment. 
I thought it to be inconceivable and I never had heard of it before. My first thought was that my grandfather had been framed through this anonymous note. I wondered where it came from. There was no answer to that question. Vince was very much in search of retrieving more information from my memory. I was surprised that Vince paid so much attention to the note. That was very disturbing to me. I asked for more details, but I didn't get them. After that, of course, it gave me many a sleepless night. Following, we started searching for information about my grandfather ourselves. We found books and reports. We visited the National Archives. Furthermore, the internet proved to be a rich source of information. We found many relevant details adding to what was known in our family about my grandparents. Arnold's actions dur during the war, going into hiding, when the threat of arrest and deportation was imminent, revealed him, as told in our family stories, to be a personality for whom betrayal absolutely was out of the question. We realized that my grandfather would appear in the book, but certainly didn't expect him to be presented as a traitor. Thijs requested a second conversation with me. In that meeting, in the spring of 2019, I emphatically brought to his attention two recent books with passages about, amongst others, Arnold's hiding. At my request, there was another conversation with Vince in the early summer of 2019. Among other things, we talked about my grandfather's hiding in Laren again. Vince did not seem to think it was important. In his theory, Arnold walked through Amsterdam in complete freedom from the beginning of 1944. He had no proof of that, for that matter. Vince would not say anything about the development of the investigation. He only said that there was a list of possible suspected traitors and that they ruled out the theory that the discovery of the people hiding in the secret annex happened by chance. In the summer of 2020, Thijs called, Rosemary Sullivan is going to write a book about the cold case study. Since I would be mentioned in the book, he advised me to use a pseudonym. Therefore, I provided a pseudonym. I asked about the contents of the forthcoming book. He told me that he was not able to provide any information. It was not until the evening of Friday, January 14, this year, just before the media campaign began on January 6, 17th, that Vince called me. He told, he told her that based on an anonymous note, the book presented my grandfather as the traitor with 85 to 87% certainty. At the same time, he added he sympathized with Arnold. He had committed a betrayal to save his own family. Anyone would have done that. Apparently, the degree of certainty had reached a full 100% now. Besides, if it turned out not to be true after all, which he couldn't imagine, the book would be revised. What can one say in response to this? How can you anyone take the copy of that anonymous note so seriously? How can one portray my grandfather as a traitor and what's more with such an absurd 87th certainty percent? There was absolutely no need for my grandfather to save his family in the summer of 1944 as he, my grandfather, my aunt and my mother 
had already gone into hiding much earlier. I was too stunned to respond. How could anyone write a book whose final conclusion is so demonstrably false? Over the weekend, I got to see the book for the first time, the digital version only, including the chapter about me. When I asked why I had to hear this so very late, the team told me that the publisher Harper Collins had forbidden them to notify the granddaughter of this sooner. When I asked for more detailed evidence, they invited me to look at the material at the team's office at a later stage. The team informed me that a worldwide media campaign would begin on January 17th and that the book subsequently would be published in 23 languages. I also received a sample text for a press statement for the Dutch and the international media. I made some drastic changes. In doing so, I instantly dis distanced myself from the contents of the book. I had no idea what was going to happen. Moreover, I had not had the time to read the book yet. We watched the news on Monday, January 17th. Everywhere there were the same headlines. A Jewish notary mentioned by name, member of the Jewish council had betrayed Anne Frank. It was the opening item of the Dutch NOS news. All of this was downright shocking. Immediately we received messages from distressed family members. They were dismayed. To my surprise, that same afternoon there were already, already strong substantial criticism regarding the inaccurate claims about the Jewish Council and the alleged list of hiding addresses. Very quickly, from January 18th, when the Dutch translation, translation was released, criticism of the book grew and grew thanks to many journalists, historians, writers and columnists. It was an extraordinary experience as an incredible number of people so deeply had been affected by this book and continuous, continued to speak out for weeks against this slander and injustice. The European Jewish Congress asked the American publisher Harper Collins to take the book out of circulation. German media were fiercely critical as well. The book has not appeared in German translation yet. All these counter reactions were of great support to me. So unexpected and so eloquent and perceptive, crystal clear and with well founded arguments. The Dutch publisher Ambo Antos fortunately apologized for the book to their own authors. In their book insert, they write that the conclusion of the investigation insufficiently is supported by the available evidence. They also offer an apology, especially to the next kin and next of kin and other family members of Arnold van den Berg. The writer's response to the criticism, in their view, a smear campaign amounted to amounted to reiterations of what they previously had written in the book. My personal life was turned upside down. The matter prevailed in my thoughts, but I had to continue working as if nothing had happened. Fortunately, the Dutch journalists who wanted to speak to me were very sympath sympathetic. At that time, I didn't want to be in the media. I would like to address the cold case team and Mrs. Sullivan, especially with a few words. Writers, in your introduction, you speak of values and norms in a democracy. 
that this must be preserved above all. Yes, even strengthened, and that your book wants to be conducive to this. How for the world can you claim this in light of your immoral behavior towards my family? You have distorted my story in such a manner that you can incorporate it into your arguments to accuse my grandfather of treason. He gets guiltier by the chapter and that, without proof, on false grounds unimaginable for anyone else. This is what I call treason. To misrepresent the truth in this matter, manner and especially the truth of a war. The team approached me in 2018 under false pretenses. You didn't tell me about the note, which was so crucial in your way, in your view. In the book, I, know, I now read that the note was already in your possession at that time. Many things went wrong in chapter 40 about me. I will limit myself to a few examples here. My grandparents and their children did not live on the Minervlaan in Amsterdam at the end of the war. They were all in hiding, as I made explicit in all interviews with the team. In the last two conversations with the team in 2019, I provided more detailed information. My grandparents had to go into hiding in early 1944 after being warned by the resistance of impending arrest. This is not to be found anywhere in chapter 40 or for that matter elsewhere in the book. How would you feel if a grandparent beloved in the family was accused in such a manner all over the world? Mrs. Sullivan, do you realize how you present yourself by writing this book in this way, so accusatory, so amoral, so ahistorical, so unjust to many involved at this time, so shocking to the extended families, their children and grandchildren, and most of all, so damaging to the real understanding of what took place in the Netherlands during the Second World War. Mr. President of HarperCollins Publishers, Miss Sullivan, Mrs. Sullivan and the cold case team, you must, you must have known you were going too far. In any decent investigation, I would have been allowed to read beforehand what was written about me and my family. There would have been room for adjustments and for open discussion based on the source material. Then you would not have been able to accuse my grandfather without the possibility of defense. But apparently that didn't fit your mold as the book never would have been published. Without such a plot as the one we have now, with a Jewish notary as the betrayer of Anne Frank, no one would have been interested. I deeply resent you for your conduct, conduct in this matter. In conclusion, I would like to make an urgent appeal to the American publisher HarperCollins, to all other publishers involved and to any potential filmmakers. Take the book out of circulation. Refrain from making films or television series with this story as their subject. With this story, you are exploiting the name of Anne Frank, you are falsifying history, and you are contributing to great injustice. Thank you very much. I would like to invite Mr. Ruben Viss of the Netherlands Israelis Kerkgenootschap to discuss the impression the book made on the Jewish community in Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.
first of all, the researchers, and especially Miriam de Gorter for her moving and wise words she gave to the world. I'd like to speak how the world got betrayed by the Anne Frank cold case team. When the news broke on January 17th, the British newspaper, the Daily Mail headlined, Anne Frank was betrayed by a Jewish notary. The word Jewish in capitals. The Shoah is not history. The Holocaust and its aftermath is what we, the Jewish community, is confronted with till today, every day. Amsterdam was emptied out of 10% of its inhabitants. And now it was a Jew in capitals who betrayed Anne Frank, the icon Jewish victim of the Holocaust. We know what it is, what being betrayed means. Close to a third of the Jews in hiding were betrayed. Every Dutch Jewish family has being betrayed in their DNA. When the news broke, I immediately asked the essential question. Where was Mr. Arnold Vandenberg at the time Anne Frank and the seven others were arrested? Where was Mr. Arnold Vandenberg on August 4, 1944? It took me less than 50 minutes to find out what a whole team couldn't bring to the light in six years of research. Mr. Vandenberg and his wife were in hiding in Laren. That village, Laren, was where my now 91 years old uncle was in hiding too, till he was betrayed. Miraculously, he survived. The whole family survived. Why was Laren left out as an option in the book, which was published based on the findings of the Anne Frank cold case team? And like you, Mrs. de Gorter, Thijs Bynes also came to me, to my office. And I wonder till today what he came to do. He wanted my trust. I just listened to him. And thank God I didn't do more than that at the time. You wonder why did the cold case team lack reflection? There's but one answer to me. Because it didn't want reflection. The damage caused by the Anne Frank cold case team's abhorrent conclusions is colossal. As Eve Kugelman, head of the Basel-based Anne Frank Fund, said, the research, the research team's ramshackle conclusions are grist to the mill of anti-Semites and conspiracy theorists. And we have heard the analysis of Dr. Raymond Schutz about the value of this book in the, frame, the framework of anti-Semitism. The danger of such an accusation as made by the cold case team is not to be considered lightly. Anti-Semitism is there in Europe and lately we have seen serious physical manifestations of anti-Semitism in the United States too. Anti-Semitism didn't suddenly stop in May 1945, nor did the experience of being betrayed. A new generation of Jews grew up in this liberated country, but not liberated of the feeling of betrayal. On the contrary, being betrayed was implanted in the DNA of the Jews in the Netherlands. Jews not just the ones in the Netherlands, unfortunately, not wrongly, think that they too could one day be Anne Frank. Anne Frank became universally known all over the world. Now the cold case team betrayed the world by pointing the finger at Mr. Arnold Vandenberg. The betrayal of Anne Frank, the book, 
is being published by HarperCollins in over 20 countries. And the European Jewish Congress, as has been mentioned before, asked, demanded, approached HarperCollins to stop publishing the book. The Australian branch of HarperCollins accompanies the publication with the following explanation on its Twitter account. The findings published in full in the book, The Betrayal of Anne Frank, are already provoking soul-searching in the Netherlands." End of quote. In the meantime, I speak with Holocaust survivors and today's Jewish community. If anything is being provoked by the publication of the book, it's their hearts and their souls. Thank you very much. Uh, tonight, a respected Dutch publishing house, Ambo Antos, decided to withdraw their hands of the book and stop publishing it in the Netherlands. And we all hope, this is news from the NOS side, that Harper Collins will do the same. I would like to thank Jetske Brouwer of Spui 25, who made a lot of things possible tonight uh, and I would like to wish you a calm and pleasant evening.